the problem of how we understand other people has always been um, a very complicated one and even in very simple situations if we see another person um, pick up a cup of tea or we see them make a particular symbol with their hands or something then we're often able to understand without even thinking about it what it is that they, they're doing and um, what it is that they mean. Um, in the last two decades there's been an enormous amount of research um, on this area to try and uncover what are the mechanisms in the brain that let us understand other people's behaviour um, in very simple ways and there's been a very influential discovery um, of things called mirror neurons. It's a discovery that was made um, nearly 20 years ago now by neuroscientists working in Italy, in Parma, and they were studying um, macaque monkeys as the monkeys move and pick up a peanut. Um, and they found that there were individual neurons in the premotor cortex of the monkey which would respond not only when the monkey picks up a peanut but also when the monkey sees a person pick up a peanut. So these individual neurons, the sort of basic units of the brain, are linking together the actions that you see and the actions that you do yourself. And these were named mirror neurons um, and this has been an incredibly influential discovery um, because for the first time it gave people a handle on the idea that there could be some very very basic mechanism um, in really in the motor system of the monkey that actually allows you to do something social and link the things that you see um, up to the actions that you do yourself so these were discovered now almost 20 years ago but there's still a lot of controversy over how they work and what they do and how important they really are to our social lives. Some of the things um, that are very interesting in this area is the question of how important are these neurons for really understanding what another person's doing. So if you see another person um, grasping an object, do you have to use your mirror neurons to understand that? And we've studied um, how, for example, if you use um, a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, you put a magnet over the outside of a person's head and you can put a pulse through that magnet and deactivate the part of their brain that's underneath the magnet. So this is a very, very rapid thing. It rapidly just disrupts the neurons underneath the magnet. And if you do that, over areas like the premotor cortex where people have mirror neurons and at the same time you're asking people to do quite a difficult task where they have to understand another person then their performance gets much much worse so we've been able to provide some data saying that maybe we think these mirror neurons or at least these areas of the brain that have mirror neurons are very important for understanding the behavior of other people um, and certainly we know also if people have strokes that damage these areas then that can have quite a big impact, not only on their ability to perform actions, but also um, it may impact on their ability to understand other people. So the mirror neurons are found mainly in two areas of the brain, in the premotor cortex and also in the parietal cortex. Um, and um, there's a variety of different ways of classifying them. Some of them are very, very selective. They will only respond if the monkey picks up a peanut and also if the person watch, that they're watching picks up a peanut. But others are much more general and will respond to a variety of actions. So it's been quite controversial as to um, what the mechanism is and how precise this matching needs to be in order for it to be socially useful. Um, the other question that's been a very big controversy in the area of mirror neurons is the question of where do they come from in terms of evolution. So have we um, evolved to have mirror neurons and that this could be a change um, from millions of years ago that our mirror neurons got better and better and are there driven by evolution to allow us to interact with other people. Um, or the rival theory is that actually this is something that we learn throughout our lives, that when babies are born, they don't have any mirror neurons, but that when they see actions and when they do actions, then they make connections between the images that they see in front of them and the actual movements of their hand. And by making those connections, they create mirror neurons. And over the last few years, there's been increasing evidence that um, we create mirror neurons through performing actions and through observing our own actions and observing the actions of other people. A baby at four months old will spend about 40% of its waking time looking at its own hand um, because it's really learning and working very hard to learn those connections between the image that you see if you took a photograph of your hand and the movements that you make when you send signals to your muscles to uh, move your hand. And we think that those kind of connections are part of what's um, 
setting up mirror neurons. Um, we're doing some studies at the moment with some collaborators to look at babies and we can now record brain activity in babies while they're learning these things um, and try to see these systems come online as babies develop. An important question that arose when um, mirror neurons are first discovered was the question of what happens um, if mirror neurons go wrong, what would go wrong in somebody's brain if these mirror neurons weren't there and what would be different about them. Um, and very rapidly there was a theory put forward called the broken mirror theory of autism where some researchers suggested that if you didn't have these mirror neurons that could be a potential cause of autism. Autism is a developmental disorder um, where children don't interact with other people in the same way, they often withdraw from other people um, and maybe they don't imitate to the same extent, they don't do some of the things um, that you expect in terms of normal social interaction. And so this idea that these children might have difficulties with their mirror neurons um, was something that got a lot of popular press. But when we actually turn to look at it rigorously, we find that it, the idea doesn't really make much sense. So if we test the children on tasks that specifically require them to use their mirror neurons, they do fine. And we've put the, um, them in brain scanners, we put adults in brain scanners and show them um, pictures of people doing movements and different kinds of movements and we find that their mirror neurons respond in just the same way as other people. The, the brain systems that contain mirror neurons are behaving in the same way. So um, it's interesting to see I guess how this controversy has developed about how our theories of what's going on in autism um, need to move on and we need to find more sophisticated models because we know there are a lot of differences in these children um, but um, it isn't just due to things that are go going wrong with mirror neurons. So we know that um, macaque monkeys have a small number of mirror neurons, um, but the kind of methods that we use to look at whether or not you've got mirror neurons, which is either recording inside the brain or doing MRI scans, are methods that we can't do um, with apes or chimpanzees because they tend not to like sitting in MRI scans. So we don't know is the answer. We, we think it's very likely, and especially if you take the view that these, that these um, neurons are learnt, then um, they would have ample opportunity to learn this, um, but we don't have any definitive evidence for that yet. So we think that mirror neurons are very important um, in terms of helping us understand some of the very basic mechanisms of social interaction. And if we've got those basic building blocks, we can then understand how people would build on those for more complex interactions. They're also something um, that turns out to be very important in um, motor disorders, so in people who have a stroke, as I said, um, a stroke can affect your ability to perform actions um, if the stroke affects the motor cortex, but also to understand actions. Um, it turns out there may also be some differences, um, things like people are looking at differences in people with Parkinson's disease who have difficulties performing movements. Um, and this idea that the actions that you can perform um, help you understand other people's actions is something that seems to be very, very fundamental. So there's some very interesting studies showing that if you learn a new motor skill, if you learn a new type of ballet, then that changes your brain, that changes um, your mirror neuron system and gives you a much greater understanding of other people performing that kind of um, skill. So there's a couple of very interesting studies where, for example, um, we take people who have never done modern dance before and train them up over the course of five weeks to do a particular kind of modern dance and scan them every week to see how their brain changes um, and find that then as they learn the dance they also show different patterns and more patterns of brain activation in the mirror neuron system um, as they are able to understand in much more detail and in a much greater um, fashion the kind of dance that they're seeing when another person is performing the modern dance. So the mirror neuron system really is giving us some sort of key insights into basic mechanisms of visual motor learning and um, how people acquire new skills and then use those skills in a social way to make sense of other people. So the main questions in the field of mirror neuron research for the future is to understand how does this system relate to other brain systems? Um, how does information from the mirror neuron systems feed into other brain systems that allow us to infer um, social things about who's nice, or who's not nice, or who to interact with, um, and other kinds of social relationships. 
and similarly to understand the relationship between mirror neurons and emotion processing because emotions appear in the face um, sometimes we use our own face to copy the emotions that we see and we don't know yet how much that contributes to let us understand. Do we have mirror neurons for facial emotions? Um, and is it the same principles that we're using in mirror neuron systems that also let us have an emotional connection with other people? Um, and then how the whole sort of puzzle fits together into the broader idea of the social brain. So one of the key questions that came up when we first started studying mirror neurons was the question of what is it um, that these neurons actually care about and there's a very interesting feature when you're trying to um, understand actions and make sense of actions that an action can be understood on many different levels so if you saw a person reaching out to a tree to pick an apple then you could understand that action you could represent it in your mind in terms of the goal of the action to take an apple from the tree but you could also think about the shape of the hand without caring about what the object is. You'd have the same shape of the hand to grasp an apple or to grasp a tennis ball or something else. Um, and so it was, it's a very important question to know, does the brain care about hand shapes or does it care about the object itself that you're taking, the apple or the tennis ball? But because these things are intrinsically linked, it becomes very hard in terms of the methods to separate them out. Every time you show a person a picture or a movie of um, a person grasping an apple, both the hand shape and the apple are there at once. Um, so we spent some time devising um, experiments that would let us separate these things out. Um, and we showed that if you show people the same movie twice in a row, then for the second one, you get slightly less brain activation, something called repetition suppression. Um, it means that the thing you're seeing maybe has become predictable. So if you see the same hand shape twice in a row, the hand shape for grasping an apple, then um, the brain activation will be suppressed if that particular region of the brain encodes the shape of the hand. But if you see the same hand shape grasping an apple, and then the next time the same hand shape is grasping a tennis ball, then because you're taking a different object, the brain activation won't be suppressed but only if the brain um, actually cares what the identity of the object is. And so we were able to use this method um, in an MRI scanner with brain imaging to make show that there's some areas of your brain that really care about the shape of your hand, whereas there's other areas of the brain that really care about what the object is that you're grasping. Um, and so making these kind of more detailed distinctions is important, first because it will give you a much... Um, better interpretation of what's happening, for example, in people who had a stroke or had some form of brain damage that affects one of these brain areas and not the other. Um, but also almost on a more philosophical level, it's showing that these different concepts we have about things in the everyday world, like grasping a particular kind of an object, really are encoded in particular brain regions and that we can distinguish within the brain between these different ideas about the goal of an action or the way an action has been performed, which philosophers might have talked about, but we couldn't before sort of see the psychological reality of these kind of concepts and see how they work in the brain. And we think that there's probably mirror neurons that deal with both of these different levels. Um, and then you have to integrate the system together in order to have a whole understanding um, of what another person's action is um, and what you're going to do with it.